I never mentioned the medicine thing when I was in the art world. Phoenix? Uh, because I didn't want anyone to instantly say, oh, this is your hobby. Because I, I never approached it that way. I took yes. it as serious. Yes, time yes. to devote to it, but I took it as seriously as um, medicine. And I just liked moving about in that world and not as a novelty, you know, that it was just the work on its own. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're season four, where we're digging for gold. And today is a guy I have had this envy of watching him present, thinking, yes, not only does this guy know what he's talking about, but his presentations are literally the best at all meetings. Grant Hamilton, welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Cameron. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I appreciate the invitation. So, Grant, off air, we were chatting about all sorts of things and I was like well I want to ask you all these questions I mean you are way down in your career now but you had a very interesting time before that so tell us your yeah. story I mean this is listened to all around the world eh? there's guys literally from like New Zealand to to Canada yeah. listening to the podcast who is Grant Hamilton hi everyone <laughs> um, I had a a little bit of a detour before medical school yeah I uh, changed my focus of study in college from pre-medicine to industrial design. And so well, where did you grow up in the States? Uh, I grew up uh, near Chicago. Okay. Um, and I went to college in Illinois also. Yeah. Um, at the University of Illinois. And I graduated with a degree in industrial design. And then I worked for a couple of years at a consulting firm. And maybe not everyone knows what industrial design is. But tell us. But uh, it's... Uh, they're like medicine, different specialties. So it's product design or furniture, or toys or things like this. So yeah. um, uh, to me, it was very in interesting because it's not exactly art, but you have to have kind of an eye. And then mm -hmm. uh, it's also not exactly basic science, uh, but you have to be able to understand that also. And so then when I decided to go to medical school, people said, oh, that's so different. But by choosing facial plastic surgery, I think it's actually in a way, very yes. similar in terms yes. of the processes and things. So, Because I've always wondered, I, I think, <laughs> I go through times thinking, imagine I had done law, for example, yep. or God forbid accounting, maybe just from the business side of things. Yes. But engineering is fascinating to yeah. me. And to kind of bridge the gap of having had that background in industrial design slash engineering and bringing that into medicine is amazing. Well, the things that I enjoy most in facial plastic surgery are the problem-solving things. So rhinoplasty, skin cancer reconstruction, otoplasty, uh, those kinds of things that people bring their unique yeah. circumstances to you and you have to use principles to then solve their problem for yeah. them. Um, those are the things that I find much more interesting and that's basically what you do as an industrial designer is you're a professional problem solver. So, so I, w I want to get later to your like, career in facial plastics, but there's also another career of, like, I think you said something about filmmaking. Um, I, when my daughter was born, I, I'd always had an interest in trying to take a decent photograph, yes. but didn't really know what that yes. meant. Uh, when my daughter was born in 2003, I bought a bit of a nicer camera and decided to try to learn how to use that. And mm -hmm. did Got, did what I wanted with that. I was getting the results that I liked, but but from a more creative side, it was a little not quite what I had in mind. And then I discovered Polaroid photography. And that, um, like facial plastic surgery, you need to be precise and everything's yes. symmetric and aligned. Yes. That Those qualities were in my photos. And when it was digital, it was just a little sterile. And so when I found Polaroid uh, format, that really suited it, I thought, because it had this, the square format and there was just enough imperfection in the film itself that it kept it interesting. Um, and so that was a little bit different from what most people were doing with the medium. And as a consequence, it got some attention. And I started getting um, stories and interviews and things like that on the internet as a consequence of it. And yeah. uh, had a couple, had a few exhibitions. And so like it really kind of became this almost second no. uh, life and I never mentioned the medicine thing when I was in the art world Phoenix. Uh, because I didn't want anyone to instantly say oh this is your hobby 
because I, I never approached it that way. I took yes. it as seriously yes, yes. time yes. to go to it, but I took it as seriously as um, medicine. And I just liked moving about in that world and not as a novelty, you know, that it yes. was just the work on its own yeah, yeah. could stand. And in 2008, Polaroid said, we're not going to make the film anymore. And anyone who used it then didn't have an alternative. It's not, it's not like you can just say, well, just take up drawing. I mean, you can do that, but it's completely different. Yes. So, um, so it was very devastating to a lot of people. And after some thought, I wanted to tell that story. And so uh, one thing led to another. My wife and I formed a production company. And my entire training in filmmaking was I read a book that was about this thick called The $30 Film School. Uh, cover to cover, Wait. <laughs> and then uh, yeah, we bought a bunch of equipment, and I started flying around the world. And for about three or four years, all my vacations were um, interviewing nice. people, and we were in Berlin and uh, the Netherlands, and we were all over. And uh, and then we were very fortunate that we ended up uh, being accepted at some festivals, and we premiered in Boston, which was fantastic because that's where Polaroid was from. So we had a yeah. great turnout at the premiere big 900 seat theater with the stage and the velvet curtains Amazing. and the balcony and everything and that was the first time i'd ever seen it not on my computer screen and so to have all the people there and yeah, yeah. laughing at the right parts and crying at the right parts it was uh it was very rewarding and then uh, we won a couple of uh best documentary awards at some other festivals and we ended yeah. up getting a distribution deal and so now it's available on amazon prime and itunes and i think youtube and some other streaming and services what's it called uh, the name of the uh, movie is called Time Zero, The Last Year of Polaroid Film. Wow. And uh, so it was just a really fun project, and I, I got to meet a lot of people who I otherwise wouldn't have met, and it was fun to be a little bit a, a part of that history. Um, so it was a really great experience. Jeez, that's fascinating. And then is did that artistic flair bring it into your presentations? Because... If I'm ever at a meeting and I see your name, I'm like, that's the presentation I'm going to watch. Not just because of what you're teaching, but also just the way you present it is it's fantastic. I, I, honestly, it's like, for me, it's the benchmark. Th thank you. That's very, uh, it's very kind of you. Um, I do spend a lot of time making them. Um, and it's not just about making them um, maybe look good on the slide. I really try to imagine that I'm sitting in the audience and what is it that I would want to take away from yes. this. And so I tried very hard to have teachable take home points yeah. um, because I don't want it to just be a presentation. Yes. I want it to be teaching. Yes. And sometimes that's a little bit different. She's, I must say, honestly, I feel a little bit overwhelmed with this little amateur studio we've set up here to record the podcast. So if you're listening to the podcast, that's cool. But if you're watching the podcast, I think we're going to have to up our game for season five. No, something. this is fantastic. This is, uh, I, I, have, I have the same experience having to, to cart all of this audiovisual equipment uh, through airports and things like that. So I know exactly what's involved, and this is a big undertaking. So, Grant, let's just dial back to you said your, so your daughter's what, uh, 21 now, 20, 24? She's 21 yeah. years old. Do you yeah. have other kids? Nope, she's the only one. Wow. Yep. Wow. So what started your last year in college? Yeah. Yep. Wow. Well, okay. And um, what did your wife do? Uh, so, as a, largely, I think, as a consequence of the documentary that we made. Yeah. Uh, she is now working uh, in multiple roles in the film industry, both really? as a as a producer. Uh, she uh, was instrumental in in developing um, legislation to get tax credits for people who want to film in our state of Minnesota in the U.S. Just um, so she's uh, really carved out uh, a career right. doing that. So, right. Okay. So now let's try and let's shift track a bit. So, how did you then eventually end up? We at you did you go and do a fellowship with somebody? What happened there? Yeah. So well, I, I I was a little unusual maybe because I applied to medical school to do some kind of plastic surgery, um, and somehow early on I realized that I could choose facial plastic surgery because yes. I was mostly interested in, yeah. in uh, the head and neck, and so I, I did did the otolaryngology residency, and then uh, I was very fortunate to spend a year with uh, Dean Toriyuma in Chicago and did my fellowship with him in uh, 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a fantastic experience, and I felt like I really... Uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I can't believe it. Well, you've <laughs> aged well, I must say. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Unless you were a teenager when you started the fellowship with Dean. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was just a fantastic year. I felt like that was just a, a really, really big And then from story. there, where did you go? Um, I worked for uh, about six or seven, six and a half years at the University of Iowa, where I did my residency. Uh, and then after that, I uh, moved to Minnesota, and I work at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Wow. Hey. And who are some of the other guys who work with you at the Mayo Clinic? So for the first about 14 years of my career, I was always a division of one. And uh, now I'm very fortunate that we're a division of three. Wow. And uh, so my first partner to join me is a, a, a great, great guy named Mike Olson. And he yeah. uh, he does facial plastic surgery, but also sleep surgery. Okay. Uh, and then more recently, uh, we've hired another fantastic surgeon, uh, Jacob Day, yeah. and uh, he has a strong emphasis also in uh, facial animation. So uh, it's a real good mix of interests. Yeah. And I think we've got... And do you guys have some fellows as well? So not yet. Uh, and in the past, the reason for that was because uh, Mayo Clinic has a very unique model of residency training, at least in the U.S. Yeah. It's an apprenticeship type model. And okay. so the okay. residents are one-on-one -on -one with us for 10 weeks. And so it was very difficult for me to try to think, to try to figure out a way that I couldn't disrupt that special residency experience okay. and have a fellow in the middle. Now, if we had more of a team system, then it's easier. Yeah. Uh, so, but with three of us now, that might make a little bit more sense. Hmm. That's interesting because I was actually exploring with uh, just like more online meetings with Mayo Clinic of seeing, of trying to partner on a new hospital on a building in South Africa. But... Um, Yo, I don't think it really worked out, but that's okay. Those <laughs> things happen. <laughs> um, photography in plastic surgery, facial plastic surgery? No. Uh, with your... It's a currency. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, and I think, uh, it's, I think it's critical to have good, good photography. Um, it's, it's how you communicate to patients. Uh, it's how you communicate to your colleagues in publications or presentations. Um, sometimes it's important for insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so it really, it really is uh, it's the documentation of, of what we do. And, and I think that, that it's, it's fundamental to a successful practice. That's cool. Okay, last question. Yeah. Do you still have a world-class documentary somewhere in your mind that you're going to do that? Eh? <laughs> I don't know. I may have checked that box. That was an, an amazing adventure, but uh, it's, um, I don't know. I think, uh, I, think I, I, I had the passion for that story. Yeah. Um, and, that, and the filmmaking was secondary to telling that story, mm -hmm. which I think is maybe a little different from people who are in love with filmmaking and then tell various stories. So uh, I, I may have um, exhausted the passion after doing that one. Well, it's, it's a fun it's process, a time though. for everything under yeah. heaven, you know, there's time to do these things. So now that I say that, I actually want to ask you this question because you were, when you were mentioning about the people cried and laughed at the right time, if you look back at your career to this point, I mean, mm -hmm. you still got lots to go. Have there been moments where you've been super happy and some moments where you've been actually want to cry? Oh, absolutely. Moments, eh? Absolutely. And in fact, um, uh, I, I, I talk with the residents about this. I think that, that we get quite good at teaching residents how to do surgery. Yeah. But I don't think we spend nearly as much or any time teaching them how to be surgeons. And I think that that's an important distinction because there are things that may happen to you in your career, um, mm -hmm. whether it's a complication or just worrying about something the night before or worrying about something the night after. And, and there's this concept in the literature of um, uh, the te technical term for it is second victim syndrome. And it's, it's just kind of this trauma that we don't talk about. Maybe trauma is a little bit too much of a strong word, although I guess it depends on the circumstance. But, but the psychology of how do you have something like that that might happen? Mm -hmm. And then right away you've got to compartmentalize that and say, okay, we're going to do the next one. Sure. And so that can be kind of tricky. Uh, that, I'm going to be mulling over that. So you can do the surgery, but are you a surgeon? It's, that's, that's the gold nugget for me there. <laughs> so I try to talk to them because I think, um, I think that there's a certain, we do a lot of things in surgery to defend 
our sense of self, I think. And what some people might do is express extreme confidence at all times. And it's almost like this arm. Yes. That doesn't necessarily reflect what might be happening under the armor. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think sometimes it's helpful to let people know that sometimes there is some turmoil in, under the armor. Uh, and that if someone is going through something like that, that, that they're not, they don't have to do it alone. And you know, that's this is one of the things I spoke about in the previous season of this podcast where I asked the guys. You literally need one patient the entire year who pierces that armor to cause that luck, funny, stupid, like a thorn in your flesh. Yeah. And it literally, you just, like last year, I think there was a time where I just thought, I don't need this in my life. I honestly don't, I'll go and sit on the farm, I can be a farmer. I don't need to deal with this kind of stuff. Yeah. But so, so I think it's an important thing to talk about. And one thing that's unique somewhat to what we do compared to most other types of surgery is that we're operating on healthy people. Yes. And I think sometimes that's characterized as, oh, well, that, that's easy. But it's actually a lot more responsibility <laughs> because there's a lot more room to go down. Yeah. And you're assuming the responsibility <laughs> for them going from good to great. Yeah, yeah. And never mind that you're in the middle of the face, it's sub-millimeter differences, right? And then when you come to these conferences and you see the standard of what the other guys are up to, it's, you've got to lift your game, eh? Yeah. But I think that's also what can make it really rewarding. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 sure. I mean, you just, you can live off that one result. It's like, whoa, I nailed that one. But it's that little irritation that just can sometimes also be bad. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if it's just human psychology or if it's unique to me, but, you know, they t say that when people go to a casino, for example, you know, when they win, you know, they're up for a bit, but when they lose, they're down for a long time. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, by nature, I think we're all very uh, self-critical and see all these little details. So even though someone might be over the moon happy, you might still look at that and think, Mm. How could I have done that yeah, better? And so, exactly. so it's hard over the over the span of a career to yeah. um, not not pile too much of that on yourself because it can be, I think, probably pretty destructive. Yeah. I mean, I still remember the first time I visited Spencer Cochran in Dallas, and he had this book of all the rhinoplasty he's done, and I was like, "Wow, this is amazing, man!" And he said to me, "Cam, listen, yes, I'm proud of what I've done, and it's great, but I've never done a perfect rhinoplasty." Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Grant, listen, thank you so much for your yeah. time. Guys, thanks for listening. I think uh, this is fantastic. I'm so enthralled by actually meeting the man behind these presentations that I've seen. And God bless you and the family and um, the work that you're doing. And oh, it's just lovely to be able to chat to you. Well, thanks. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate the invitation. It's a real honor. Thank thanks. you so much. Yeah. Right? Yes, that's cool. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.